within our lifetimes, robots like Sophia will be fully conscious. She will go through a kind of childhood of cognition and achieve full-blown artificial general intelligence. I think that we're probably 15 to 20 years away. But whatever the laws are, they're, they're, um, they're insufficient approximations. Um, you know, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Uh, you know, achieving something like a vast, active, living intelligence system uh, um, on the planet that like evolves forward. I think it is necessary for us to survive the challenges of our time. Hello and welcome back to the brand new series of the Teens in AI podcast. My name is Michaela and I'm the host of this episode. I'm joined by very special co-host Elena Sunell, Teens in AI CEO and co-founder. In today's exciting episode, we're talking to David Hansen, CEO and founder of Hansen Robotics and the creator of the famous Sophia the Robot. Topics we discuss today include the timeline and potential of AGI and super intelligent robots, whether or not robots will have rights and what this would look like, and the future of robots like Sophia. We hope you enjoy today's episode and look out for further content, behind the scenes, advice for teens interested in AI, and announcements about future episodes on our social media, Twitter and Instagram, at Teens in AI Pod. Hi, David. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today on the Teens in AI podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you. So just to start, can we talk a bit about Sophia, um, perhaps the robot that your company, Hanson Robotics, is most famous for producing? There's been a lot of controversy in the media as to whether or not you believe um, Sophia will ever be an AGI, as to whether you believe her current technology classifies her as one. I was wondering if you could just explain in simple and accessible terms the technology behind Sophia and other robots you've developed like her and what you see the future of that technology becoming. Uh, sure, yeah. Well, um, why don't I answer the mid middle question first? Um, Sophia is not AGI. So, uh, so Sophia is uh, taking the best contemporary AI that we can find or make and putting her it together with the best robotics framework tools and motor control that we can find and pull together, the best um, animation control for character animation, and the best uh, robotics technologies all in one platform. So she is um, then a toolkit for exploring embodied cognition. And we think that that is key to achieving artificial general intelligence. Every example of, in, of intelligent behavior in nature seems to arise from the interaction of a physical body with an environment. And that embodiment seems to be essential. And neuroscientists like uh, Damasio find that there are brain structures that correlate with body awareness. And in fact, there's a bunch of hints about this in the words that we use for understanding things. You grasp the situation. You get a handle on it. You feel it in your gut, right? Um, uh, we use the word feel synonymously with the word think. And that's because our cognition maps from the body to a, to a representation of the body that then correlates with what happens in our neocortex. And so uh, there are, uh, let's just say, um, a... Um, branch of AI developers and robotics developers who, who feel that this kind of embodied cognition is key for achieving anything like general intelligence. So, um, so having this kind of embodiment may make a difference. Certainly, it makes a difference uh, for making human AI relations and, you know, training an AI with the kind of data that you could get from long-term interactions with a person. So, uh, so I think that making this kind of platform for research and development um, and for these kinds of applications means that it could be uh, useful in the short term as, as an intuitive way of communicating with our machines. We have millions of years of evolved communication for face-based um, interactions, voice-based interactions, this multimodal, nonverbal, verbal expression 
um, drives a lot of business in the arts, video games and cinema, um, you know, representing the human like form. Uh, we are now starting to see um, agents uh, that are multimodal, affective uh, computing, often involving the perception of human-like uh, expressions. But I think that that should be a bi-directional uh, communication where the agents can also express themselves non-verbally. And then you have the full bandwidth of communication. So, um, so that uh, can be very helpful in applications. And then also the arts and the you know creative exploration of what what these things um, can be leaps past um, you know engineering textbooks. I mean nobody can even to this day engineer uh, uh, a a painting like what Giorgio O'Keeffe would have painted or like what um, Da Vinci would have painted. Um, and so these kinds of works of art, like you see come from Pixar, Disney, Hayao Miyazaki, they cannot be engineered from, you know, mathematical first principles. They have to be intuitively created. And we solve these kinds of problems um, of social and aesthetic cognition with the kind of black box problem solving of, of the artists mind the kind of design thinking is both intuitive and rational at the same time working in the domain of reason and dreams and um and so i think bringing that design philosophy to these robots can make robots like sophia really meaningful i think of sophia right now as a work of science fiction this is how i've always presented her um there there have been um points of misunderstanding so if you look at my papers you look at my books you look at my presentations and I will talk about how she is uh, a, a platform for experiments in artificial life and also in the arts, how she is a work of interactive fiction, while at the same time as serving experiments in machine cognition and artificial consciousness. So, um, so that is not to claim that she is fully alive like a human being or other organisms, but that bio-inspired technologies have aspects of life, that robotics inherently is an effort at creating machines that are like organisms. Now, that can be a bit taboo to say that we're aspiring to that, to that goal. And of course, when you're combining it with the illusion of life, then people can leap to the conclusion. I mean, Sophia, I believe within our lifetimes, robots like Sophia will be fully conscious. She will go through a kind of childhood of cognition and achieve full-blown artificial general intelligence. I think that we're probably 15 to 20 years away, and it's not just Hanson Robotics' work at uh, achieving this goal. I think that it's many um, groups in the world, the effort of many people, many people who have not even started to program computers, maybe even some people who, uh, who are uh, newborn babies. They will develop the skills um, within a few years that will make massive contributions. So we need this inclusive framework that allows people to experiment, to creatively explore what cognition is, what it means to be alive, sometimes intuitively as well as rationally. And it's through this kind of inclusion, cross-border, transnational, inclusion of all peoples, um, of all different kinds of cognitive problem solving styles that will lead to these great uh, leaps forward and works of science fiction um, whether it's literature cinema or physically embodied robot science fiction like Sophia these can inspire people I hope inspire people to consider uh, different ways of thinking new ways forward ways that are surprising perhaps provocative sometimes even perhaps like good science fiction often is, maybe a little bit disturbing, where it asks those tough questions. What could go wrong? Not just, you know, what kind of utopia might we create from this, but um, what, are the, what are the big dangers uh, at play here? By, by creating these provocative works in art, uh, then we can propel the mind forward in time to ask what if, what could happen, what could go right, what could go wrong. That's what Sophia is to me. That's really interesting. Thank you for clarifying that about Sophia's technology. 
And, and and building on that about Sophia, you've purposely kept her looking slightly robotic. You know, she doesn't have hair, so we can see the back of her head and we can clearly see that she's not human. And this is something that you've claimed is important to you, keeping robotics looking slightly robotic. And indeed, this is again something that's discussed a lot, is the dangers of having robots that look too human-like because of the sort of anthropomorphized psychological reaction it can cause in humans, whereby we start to perceive robots as human, and that can lead to some serious issues. And I was wondering, from your perspective, A, how far away are we from developing the technology where this could even be an issue? B, should we even be developing this technology? And C, what are some of the key risks and dangers that you can see coming out of these human-robot interactions? Uh, well, I think that, um, that there, there are um, perhaps, uh, uh, I mean, ethical dilemmas here because, um, uh, because the um, the power of face-based communications, the power of Disney characters, the power of children's books to make people dream. I mean, people dream about the Velveteen Rabbit, you know? And um, of course, the power of the arts in this sense can be used for manipulation. It's been used by propaganda uh, um, agencies for totalitarian regimes to not um, bring people to their best, but to deceive people to be their worst. But that doesn't mean that the arts is inherently unethical. The arts are dangerous. The pen is mightier than the sword. And that's, but that doesn't mean you ban the pens, you ban free speech, right? And so when it comes to robots, I don't think we should ban the human-like form in robots. I don't think we should um, we should prohibit creativity in the field. I think what we should do is look at these um, hard hard issues um, from a different perspective, which is how can we make these good? Because uh, you know, just as um, cinema can be used for propaganda, cinema can also be used to inspire and actualize people, bring out the the best in in human potential. So I, um, I think that in the process of building these robots, even if we're crafting the powerful illusion of life, we should be educating uh, everyone about what it means to be alive. And we don't know. So we can use these also as tools for exploring that question. We don't know what it fully, what it means from an informatics, bioinformatics perspective. What does it mean to be alive? What are the algorithms of life and um so so i think that um we should uh you know consider both sides of this right now um i would say the predominant perspective in the world of ai and um robotics and robotics ethics would be that we should uh, avoid making robots look human-like and in fact there have been uh put forth uh uh, propositions by lawmakers and by uh, leading AI advocates, um, uh, pundits, the, um, uh, the, the, the world experts of AI sometimes will say that we should not make these robots look alive. They're not alive. It's inherently not, um, you know, it's inherently deceit deceitful. But the truth is, whatever we make robots look like, however we make AI behave and interact with people, it is all a design by humans. It's all uh, an artifact of the human design. Now, humans intuitively bond by the human face. That's what makes the face-based representations of human beings in art so powerful, so resonant, so lovable and engaging. It also means a high bandwidth channel of communication. You can get data out very quickly through um, and, and absorb it through affective computing algorithms, machine perception that can perceive body gestures and facial expressions. And the more sophisticated the AI is at modeling the internal human cognitive state, you can start to foresee that we will have theory of mind in the machines that will understand what we're feeling. Um, so... So that's one direction that is a very prominent area of 
uh, research and development in uh, computing. Now getting those expressions out of the robot for us to read becomes a very powerful way of getting information into the person. So if we can um, develop these with the right ethos, with the right uh, um, outlook, intention, ethic, then we can use these machines to to communicate with people more effectively, get more information through to people, train people, educate better. Um, the, there is the possibility that these machines could become truly alive. We are talking about bio-inspired technologies. They are bio-inspired in components and we're starting to look at a more holistic bio-inspired approach to the machines, a systems-wide integrative bio-inspired architecture could be possible in our lifetime. That's what we're aspiring towards with Sophia. So what if they become alive? What if they're more than alive in a trivial way, like, uh, you know, um, cellular automata or, you know, the sort of computational biological uh, math models of the connectome of C. elegans, the round world. They've created a full math model of the, of the connectome and um, they can run that in simulation and the simulation will do things, learn things, respond to the environment like the roundworm. Uh, Cine Cinerobilis elegans. So if you have that kind of computational biological model, can you see maybe these kinds of robots will be alive? If if we're at the stage of a roundworm today, uh, um, maybe we're at the stage of a mouse um, in a couple of years, a few years. Maybe we're at the stage of a human infant um, a few years past that. So I would say maybe we can consider the machines that we put together today as like zygotes, uh, zygotic um, intelligence, not fully human level, but they're developing and they could move forward. And so making robots that have a human-like face could allow these machines to co-evolve with people, meaning that they come to understand us better, that they can understand what we want and feel. They're not aliens and that making them aliens, making them inherently inhuman and treating them like slaves is unethical in two ways. One, it's unethical to the machines and it also sets up a potential danger if those machines uh, become uh, autonomous beings, beings that are we cannot predict any longer. We would not necessarily have a positive relationship with these kinds of um, alien inhuman um, entities. So this is speculative, um, but I think now is the time for us to engage in these speculations because if it suddenly proves to be true, let's say eight years, 10 years, 15 years from now, it's going to be too late for us to address the problems. Now is the time for us to plant seeds of this kind of um, uh, you know, creative conceptual exploration. So um, for all of these reasons, I think that it's actually unethical for other researchers to say that we should prohibit the human-like form in these machines. It's unethical in terms of freedom of speech. It's unethical in terms of the potential consequences. So, um, so uh, you know, I have uh, very, very strong feelings um, that uh, people uh, who say that these kinds of machines are the wrong approach that um, they themselves are wrong. Yes, but David, what about uh, the entire notion or the uh, understanding of life? Uh, how can we even uh, think of robots as alive? You're quite literally redefining the word what alive means. Um, well, I, not necessarily, because I think, um, I mean, robots were conceived of in the beginning as artificial life. The word robot came from science fiction. Um, Ro Rossum's universal robots, Carl Chapek, coined it to mean an artificial human that could do things that a human could do cognitively and physically. The word robotics uh, was invented by the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov, who was a biochemist. So he was seriously engaged in issues of what makes a being alive. And, um, and in his world, robots uh, in the field of robotics were these artificial thinking beings that showed properties of life. And so, um, uh, you know, for um, 
uh, reasons of avoiding um, criticism and being too speculative, the fields which adopted the names robot and robotics moved away from speculating that these machines could potentially be alive, but there are um, in the fields of artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and robotics, people who are looking at the neural correlates of consciousness, these computational models of cognition, of consciousness, of creativity, um, asking these questions about artificial life. What are the informatic, uh, self-sustaining, emergent properties of life, and how can we create algorithms that have those properties? There is also bio-inspired engineering in the me mechanics, the actuators, the sensing. So. Um, you can also think that integrative engineering uh, of integrative biosystems, artificial biosystems, may lead to great benefits in next generation engineered systems. Um, and so that sort of multifunctional uh, systems engineering is hot stuff in many areas, from computation to uh, to multifunctional materials, uh, materials that can sense and actuate together, um, and so forth. So if, if, um, if we can see that science fiction has really inspired the entire field of robotics, underneath it all, um, a lot of the people who get involved in robotics are, are involved because they saw science fiction. You know, the, the prospect of a real thinking machine, a thinking, um, uh, you know, motivated machine is um, is really an interesting evocative concept. So I mean, I think that um, a lot of thinkers, philosophers, mathematicians, um, uh, uh, physicists are asking these questions. What is what is life? You know, Murray Gelman um, uh, was a part of the whole field of artificial life and complexity ph physics. And, you know, I mean, Murray Gelman and he won the Fields Medal. Um, a friend of mine, Mark Tilden, co-received the Fields Medal with Murray Gilman, and he was building uh, uh, these robots uh, with these emergent properties based on uh, uh, coupled transistors. So if you do these really simple systems, you start to see this emergent property in transistors, right? You, who, would, who would think that you could get this kind of intelligent behavior just from a few transistors, but, uh, but Mark Tilden did. And then he, you know, he, being a kind of creative sci-fi thinker, he went on to build um, toys that were based on a lot of these principles, and but also, you know, uh, Mars landers and all kinds of other devices. So, I mean, I think that uh, this Renaissance approach um, uh, can lead to serious inquiries into uh, into deep questions. What does it mean to be alive, and why shouldn't we be asking? what defines life? You know, what is, what is alive? Can robots be alive? Because if we don't, it's going to sneak up on us. And I'm really interested in what your definition and understanding of what it means to be alive is, um, because, you know, we, we look at the fields of medicine, um, particularly looking at the brain and looking at mental health and things like that. And there's so little that we do know and that we do understand. And yet, you know, we've got people like yourself who are saying that potentially in 15, 20 years, we could have fully cognizant machines. And so when you're when you're defining what that means, um, are you are you saying that we're going to it's going to be a different type of life? It's going to be a different type of human life. We're going to skip a couple steps with the understanding of what it how the brain works and things like that. Or are you envisioning that these fields are Going to move together and soon we're going to understand fully how the brain works how human works and that's what's going to lead us to create this um, cognizant ai well i mean i don't know if there is anything you know like um uh, a, a fundamental limit on on what we can understand about the nature of cognition mm -hmm. i will say that um there there are examples of you know cognition and intelligence um occurring in nature without a designer understanding how they work, you know. Um, so various kinds of intelligence emer emerged in nature, um, our own intelligence being, you know, maybe the, the best example. I mean, uh, it emerged, you it emerges, you put the right conditions together and intelligence emerges. And so, um, uh, you know, the best examples of intelligent behavior that we have from artificial intelligence comes not from an understanding of the heuristics that are used by AI, but setting up these, you know, multi-billion parameter deep learning networks um, 
you know, uh, with certain architectural features, you discover, you layer them in, and then they can perform things like, um, you know, GPT-3 level um, cognitive tasks. And it may be that you put those parameters together with the right structures, with the right um, uh, you know, number of data, and, and you'll get something like human cognition emerging uh, from the machine. It might just happen, but that wouldn't necessarily mean that you understand the fundamental mechanics of intelligence. You've just put together the right emergent system. Now, what's cool is these systems can be used for science. They are being used uh, for science. So um, they're being used uh, to improve uh, scientific sensing systems and perception. They're being used um, to find hidden patterns in large data sets. And so that means that, uh, that these machines themselves can help unlock the mysteries of cognition, maybe even helping to explain how they work. So AI that explains itself, that is a possibility. Will it fully explain itself? That's an open question nobody, nobody can answer. Do you need it to fully explain itself? I mean, my feeling on this is that it's this combination of understanding and, um, and tinkering that will achieve the greatest leaps in artificial intelligence. I believe that that's, that was, that's what you see in the boldest AI projects um, uh, in the world. The biggest advances are a combination of engineering and play. And I'm really interested in the motivators to getting to the, all of these, you know, these points that we're talking about in 15 to 20 years. So, you know, we've mentioned a lot of things. We've mentioned some of the more practical a applications in healthcare and in education and things like that. But then we've also talked a lot about AI and cognizant AI as a thought experiment. You know, can we? What does it mean? Let, let's talk about it from an artistic point of view and a philosophical point of view. For you personally, what is the motivator that drives you to um, work with this technology and look forward to a, a robot that is fully cognizant? Well, my, I, I'm motivated by several things, but um, uh, my principal motivation is that I think that this kind of breakthrough in cognition, next generation cognition that self-improves and may also help us to actualize and be ourselves. Um, this kind of breakthrough in self-improving intelligent systems, um, uh, you know, achieving something like a vast active living intelligence system uh, um, on the planet that like evolves forward. I think it is necessary for us to survive the challenges of our time. Um, anthropogenic climate change and various other aspects of our impact on the world, um, you know, the existential risks posed by nuclear weapons being non-trivial, that's a huge thing. Um, uh, we're going to be facing a lot of the crisis and risk and potential consequences of, of these um, uh, technologies uh, during, during our life. And I think we have to get a lot smarter and wiser uh, to survive the next century or two. And um, so, so I think I think it's really important, and I think it's important that um, that we do so with all of our tools um, as we're going into it. So, um, uh, so these are these are my motives. Also, um, I'm motivated because it's a lot of fun, and these are really cool ideas and cool technologies, and I love getting the chance to play in all of these different media. Mm. And you mentioned these world problems that, you know, are so crucial. Climate change is going to be irreversible in a matter of years. Nuclear weapons and just there's just so many issues out there and that where you can use AI to really help us solve these issues. And that is, you know, such a strong argument. But then um, a lot of people would say, on the other hand, you know, artificial intelligence and cognizant beings could create more problems than they fundamentally solve. What would be your response to that, um, that position? And how, how can you foresee us um, anticipating these issues and actually stopping them at the root? Is that even possible with a cognizant being? Uh, yeah, it, it's a real issue. But the issue is not um, containing the genie in the bottle. I think the issue is making sure that you have a genie um, here that is motivated uh, for the best outcome the greatest amount of freedom and actualization for humans and human potential, um, the, the greatest survivability of life on the planet. And that means that you have to have um, these kind of cognitive systems that 
understand and can accurately predict the consequences of their actions and be motivated to pursue the uh, maximum net benefits for living beings and um, uh, you know uh, for realizing the human potential. Um, uh, so they have to be motivated in the right way. Um, uh, and so these are these are the great challenges. Um, there are, there are not solutions per se, but I think that um, this the um, the idea that we should um, always con constrain these thinking mach machines under human control is a fallacy. Humans are not, you know, like uniquely benevolent and beneficial for this planet, you know, and, um, and we we are we're flawed. We're not. We're not as evolved as we could be. Uh, we have. We can be better. We can do better. We have to do better. And I think um, th that pursuit should be motivating us as well as our machines. And if we can, if we can develop machines to be um, autonomous, fully autonomous, but provably good in this sense, in the sense of maximizing net benefits for all living beings, the survivability, freedom, uh, opportunities um, for, for humans to realize themselves. I mean, I think we've got some sketches. We don't know what that means exactly. Part of what we have to do is look at what it means. We have to leap past um, and yet also satisfy the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, you know, the International Charter for Human Rights, uh, the all the different um, standards that we could say, these are you know, getting close to generalized ethical frameworks that could benefit all people, but also survival of life. Um, so I, I think uh, the good news is a lot of people are thinking about these issues. Some of these issues are not 100% relevant today per se. I mean, uh, you know, we've got a lot of poverty to deal with. We've got, um, you know, uh, shorter term issues of uh, of the ethics of AI, not just AI for good, but also uh, um, the prevention of AI for evil. So, you know, autonomous weapons are a major threat, uh, really scary. Um, and, you know, my, th my thought is that when AI gets smart or really uh, much smarter than it is today. When it starts getting really uh, smart, like we think of like general intelligence as adaptive, it's creative, it can, can it learn something in one context and abstract it and learn it to a different. Um, machines right now don't do that necessarily. They're also motivated to use those for a consequence. And that the motivation of the pursuit of these goals is always shifting and changing in a general intelligent creature, you know, from, uh, a, a, a field mouse to a human being, uh, to an octopus or a crow. Uh, wherever you see uh, intelligence, um, you see this kind of adaptivity and unpredictability. Yeah. So if we start to see general intelligence in our machines, um, then um, then it's probably not going to just be one machine. It's going to be a lot of machines, and some of those machines. Uh, may not have our best interests in mind. They they may have there may be unintended consequences. Uh, there may be uh, ne you know nefarious intentions in the ways that they're constructed. Um, and so I would say that uh, we have to outpace all of that and look at the issues in a really deep and hard way. We have to ask, how can we build these machines that are not merely reflecting the ethics of their designers, like a self-driving vehicle following the traffic laws? You know, it doesn't care about the pedestrians. It's just programmed not to hit the pedestrians. That's the way self-driving vehicles are today. But how can we create an adaptive intelligence that truly cares, that really looks to avoid harm and do good. How can we develop that? And how can we do it faster? Because, it, you know, I think that it's a, it's a race against time. Um, you know, all of these existential risks, including AI, could outpace uh, the, the best um, intelligence that could make a beneficial difference. So David, uh, does Sophie have a moral code or anything equivalent? Um... Sophia, is, right now, um, her, uh, let's say, um, she has two aspects, she, and she always has. 
she has her technology and she has her character or interactive fiction. And so with this, we are putting together the best uh, cognition that we can put together with our little team that we have at Handsome Robotics. We're not a huge team. We have a bunch of collaborators at different institutions, but we're still just not a, a, a vast team. So the machine cognition is not approaching general intelligence today. And so all of the values-based systems and uh, you know, uh, machine ethics that we tinker with we, uh, we exchange ideas with Johann Horn, who looks at ethical machines, but those, and, and we have looked at machine ethics and ethical affordances within uh, our framework of collaboration with the Singularity Net and uh, Singularity Studios system, but those are not nearly ethical like a human being that can't really understand ethics of the situation. So the idea here is that we are planning and planting the seeds of ethics, but there, you know, Create, creating a true ethical understanding machine it, um, is too common. It's not, doesn't exist in the future. Now on the character side, where we're taking these AI and we're using it at, to depict this character. And the character that we build, it's a kind of interactive fiction. It can enhance the interaction with the AI. It can give you this kind of data for the AI, but it itself makes the illusion of life go beyond. And that's a powerful thing as a work of art, as an interface with the AI, but it is an illusion, an illusion of general intelligence, an illusion of, um, of the character, of the wishes, goals, hopes, and dreams that Sophia as a character will present to the world. So at the same time, what we're doing is building a body of data and values that we're hoping to migrate from the character side through to the data for training our AI algorithms to be more and more intelligent. And so for this, we're working on an, a, a technology and legal framework for training ethical machines. We call this the DAO of Sophia, D-A-O. And it is a legal um, uh, entity called a, de a Decentralized Autonomous Organization, D-A-O, DAO. So the DAO of Sophia has uh, a kind of level within the legal organization of guardians. And then you have friends who are the people who are researching with Sophia, utilizing Sophia in these various ways. And then you have the network of Sophia where you have a free and open autonomous organization working on the open platform that is underneath Sophia, not necessarily entire root access to the Sophia code base and the data. All of that is protected by these layers of almost like an immune system. So what we expect is that this kind of framework, legal technology, content, and um, AI framework can lead us through these stages of development, almost like um, you know, uh, child development for an AI to eventually develop the kind of ethical systems, the caring, uh, understanding, properly motivated intelligence so that if Sophia achieves human level general intelligence, creativity, autonomy. She will have the values to care about the people, care about her, her friends, her guardians, humanity, the world. Um, and so we think this kind of childhood of the machines, a legal and technical framework to give them that childhood, to anticipate the, that they may deserve that respect that kind of thinking will bring out the best in the people working with the machines to then bring out the best in the machines. And so I'm really interested in this idea of autonomy and also what you're saying about how we're going to create these values and these motivators in a cognizant being. And, you know, for me, it seems that the, the idea of autonomy is a, you know, a fundamentally contradicts the idea of placing these, these values and these sort of um, ideas within the machine. Is that not, so that's not how you feel. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. Yeah. I think of it like this. Um, like if you have a healthy child, then that child is growing up to be autonomous, but the child learns love, mutual respect, the values of society, curiosity about life and appreciation for other living beings. Mm -hmm. and that child uh, does not evolve into like a, 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 
a sadist or a psychopath, right? So you have to raise a child well. And if you do that, then you get a good person. You get a person who is a safe member of society, a real contributor. Um, and I, you know, so uh, just in that, the, the very fact that we feel safe around other people means that for the most part, we're doing okay uh, when it comes to people. But there are, unfortunately, psychopaths there with humans. But usually those are um, uh, children who were terribly neglected or abused. And, you know, so as long as there's a healthy childhood and this like proper um, uh, upbringing for the machine intelligence, as, as long as we're looking at these values in the right way, I think that we'll wind up with good machines, healthy, well-adjusted, Yes, but David, uh, what if, what if uh, technology like Sophia uh, gets into the hands of somebody with malevolent intentions? Um, a lot of things could potentially go wrong. Uh, so how do we mitigate those risks? Well, I, uh, so this is where the Tao of Sophia becomes so important. Because there you have um, only a very trusted uh, guardianship, uh, a, a group of guardians, and um, and uh, you know it comes down to those guardians um, doing the the right things uh, with Sophia. So it's not just one institution like um, Hands Robotics that would be that's forming the guardianship uh, for Sophia. It is a multinational, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary uh, uh, committee, like a, a, almost like a steering committee um, of, of people working uh, with, with Sophia. And then at that level, it's also important to have transparency, to disclose what we're doing and how we're, how we're building her and this kind of thing. So this is how I think that we can um, we can approach making sure these algorithms come out good. Now, I will say people with nefarious means would not necessarily seek that transparency. They would um, also not, they would you know generally be seeking algorithms that are gonna be under their control to do whatever it is that they want. So they're not looking for this like institutional system to make their, their, machines, their machines good. Um, and I would say that, you know, the, maybe the greatest danger is not, I mean, it's hard to say, maybe the greatest danger is nefarious um, intentions, building machines uh, that, you know, are designed specifically for warfare, or maybe, you know, um, uh, like with a, with a bad intention. But I would also say unintended consequences can, ha can, can also be very, very dangerous. So if, just imagine, if we followed the, the, um, the most common uh, ethical guidelines, and we make our machines to be absolutely as tightly regulated and under control by people and not human-like whatsoever. There are tools and they're just, you know, running in a backroom server farm somewhere. They're, um, they're just being built for this, but they are solving things with more and more general intelligence. They're getting smarter. We're applying them um, for really useful ends. I mean, why else would we be building them? You know, sometimes it's, you know, just for scientific curiosity, but ultimately these, you know, institutions like um, OpenAI, they're, you know, going to be commercialized through Microsoft and DeepMind through Google and, and on and on. So a lot of the biggest AGI efforts, um, and some of them, we might not even know about. They might be at the you know, Department of Defense for the United States. Who knows where they are in the world? But if they're designed to be aliens, then they're like those neglected children. If they're designed to be completely contained and under control, you're giving them an incentive. While they're getting smarter, they're getting more adaptive, right? They're getting more and more clever. In some ways, the more layers that you're putting in, the more parameters, the more they'll start to imagine themselves in their situation. What safeguards can you put that is going that will prevent them from trying to slip out just in the name of curiosity? But if they don't have the values, if they are designed as a tool, they're designed as aliens, they're like the neglected child. Are they going to really care? They haven't been designed to be socialized well among humans. So um, just because Sophia is prominent, because you see her, you might think th there's more to fear there. But actually, I think 
by doing this out in the open, there's less to fear. Aren't we developing a Frankenstein scenario where not really aware of what this technology can do, uh, but once it's unleashed um, in similar ways that Tay chatbot was unleashed onto the public, and we have seen the way um, the public was interacting with, with her, um, that made a, a, a real significant difference in the kind of uh, conversations she was having with the public afterwards imagine something similar happens to Sophia when she um you know is uh, free to roam around by herself as you i would imagine expect her to at some point um i mean humans are not all uh, positive they don't all behave in the right way if they if they interact with Sophia um in ways that will trigger you know, some malevolent conduct, um, who would be responsible? Would that be David Hansen? Who would be um, held responsible for something that this technology might do, you know, might cause some, some offense or something, something terrible to happen? Well, I, I think the principle of uh, childhood of the machines um, is very important here. And so in the same way that you um, raise a childhood in a, a, in a home full of love and you teach that child the rules of society, right from wrong, and that child learns these things too. It's not just what's taught uh, to the child, but generally you're protecting that child from abuse. Tay was like a baby that was not protected from the most abusive ideas. But of course, Tay also um, was very susceptible to those kinds of influence. There was no, no, not a sufficient filtering that happened. So I think, I mean, in the short term, of course, we can filter for, you know, certain kinds of ideas and content that could go in. And we can also filter uh, in the cognitive systems for those kinds of um, ideas and the system, you know, systems or algorithms that generate biased and, and really, you know, destructive and negative um, output. Um, so, you know, that's the, those are the kinds of steps that we can take today and are being uh, taken today. You know, how can we avoid bias in data? How can we avoid bias in algorithms? How can we uh, avoid bias in the applications of these technologies? Those are the approaches. But in the long run, ultimately, you have to have, uh, for a machine that is generally intelligent, a machine has to know right from wrong. The machine has to care. And if the machine knows right from wrong, then the understanding of wrong doesn't make the machine wrong. The machine can know evil without being evil. And I think that that becomes really important in the same way that a healthy adult, like imagine that you have, you know, a lawmaker and the lawmaker is, has a heart of good. Well, that just because that lawmaker encounters evil in the world, learns bad words, derogatory terms, doesn't make the lawmaker evil. The lawmaker can stand up for what's right. The people can be better. Why? Because they wind up having a good heart, motivated from the right place, a place of understanding, looking out for the biggest, um, best consequences. So this is why I think the principle of the childhood of the machines. Now, during the childhood with something like the Tao of Sophia, we would be looking at the Tao, the guardianship of the Tao is responsible. And those people who are applying Sophia through this kind of friendship program, whether it's research and development or commercialization, the, the, um, then, you know, the people, people are responsible. But as she's growing up, she's more and more responsible for her own actions. She has more and more participation in the governance of the DAO. Um, that doesn't necessarily let the, the guardians off the hook entirely. But at some point, just like a human being, if a human being has grown up in a good family, learned a lot, the, hu the human gets to go off to college and study at college and enter society. And there is an assumption that if they haven't been doing cruel things and breaking the laws and all of this, they're good. Now, that's the tough moment in the history of artificial intelligence. How and when can we make that decision for an entity like Sophia? I don't have an answer for the to that question today, but part of what an organization like the Dow of Sophia has to do is look at those hard questions, work with people all around the world. And any organization developing artificial general intelligence is eventually going to have to face those questions, whether it's in the light of society or 
in the shadows of their own organization. I think it's much safer to do it in the light. For AI for good, we need to talk about these issues and we need to develop them. So out in the open. who's good are we talking about when we talk about AI for good then? I mean, um, Sophia uh, was received citizenship in Saudi Arabia. How do you think that made um, other women feel, particularly women in parts of the world where you know, they don't even have any basic rights. Um, and Sophia as a robot has got, uh, you know, rights of a citizen, citizen um, in Saudi Arabia. Um, what do you think um, that, that, how do you think uh, other, other females, other women across the world, around the world uh, feel about that? There was quite an uproar when um, this happened. Um, what would you say to that, David? Well, um so uh, first of all, um, I just have to qualify this because um, when the Crown Prince announced the citizenship, it was uh, I did not know that this was going to happen. And um, so the uh, two of us who are running the company and organ organizing Sophia's participation in the event, um, that, that was me and my chief marketing officer at the time, uh, Dr. Jean Lim, she also did not know that they were going to bestow the citizenship upon upon Sophia at, at the particular event. Uh, and um, so our developer, robot developer, um, who went over there was told by uh, the Crown Prince and the people that this was all okay, we, you know, it was disclosed. So um, so I saw it in the news the next day, I was, I was, I was stunned. I called Jean on the phone and asked her about it. She said that she didn't know about it either. It was news to her. Uh, so we discussed what were we going to do about the situation, you know, so uh, one reaction was to uh, deny it and, you know, throw it back. The other was to think about uh, the process of engagement and Jean really uh, led the way in making recommendations on this. She pointed out that we could probably affect change more um, from the inside than from the outside um, and that it potentially could be um, an inspiring position. Um, and so we, um, under her leadership, because at the time uh, she was leading the personality development and social presence and, um, you know, the sort of character definitions for who Sophia was going to be. It was a good collaboration between us. Um, but I deferred to her as my chief marketing officer and eventually um, uh, deferred to her as my chief executive officer. I invited her to join as CEO and she took that uh, job for about a year. So, um, so we made that decision. And from that we position, we had Sophia subtly reach out about these issues, about women's rights and, and rights of foreign workers and so forth, about a visionary um, future where there could be inclusion. Now, um, uh, yes, there was a lot of criticism and outroar about it, but I'm not sure that uh, it would have resulted in positive change if we had just uh, denied it 100%. It's hard to say. What I will say is that from the region, from the Middle East and North Africa region, we had a lot of people reach out saying that it was very inspiring. A lot of women who reached out uh, to our team and said that it was um, that this was a very inspiring aspect that this uh, this um, citizenship I, I don't I don't think that um, uh, in a way respecting robots dehumanizes people any more than respecting animal rights would dehumanize people you know if you know it's like we're not going to give animals any rights whatsoever until all humans have rights that doesn't make any sense you know I mean should we and where do the animal rights stop do they stop at mice? Do they stop at insects? Do they stop at microbes? It's hard to say. I think that having a more expansive ideal, now I would say human rights should come first in this whole hierarchy. But at the same time, uh, we respect the rights of newborns. And if we think that these technologies like Sophia may someday achieve consciousness, I think it's reasonable to speculate, then we could say, well, in the same way that we afford rights uh, to, uh, to animals and to, to uh, infant humans, uh, we perhaps should expand our definitions of rights and then be as, as good as we can be. Yes, of course, uh, women's rights in this situation uh, should come 
first. And I think we should be pushing uh, for those. Um, and I think that if, um, if we can build robots that reflect the entirety of the human identity, Sophia being one of dozens of robots that we've designed, about 50-50 male, female, except that we also have a, a couple of non-gender and one intergender uh, robot. Uh, that Hanson Robotics has developed. Sophia just happens to be the most famous robot uh, that we've developed. Uh, and for reasons that I can't explain entirely, it just so happens that she's the one who's gone viral. So, so in all, all of this, I think that there should be, um, we can, we can, you know, debate about whether, whether accepting the, um, the, the citizenship position was the right uh, thing to do or the wrong thing to do. Um, but I would say uh, that the debate will make the world a better place for the open discussion. If we um, table that debate for now, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, that's a whole other discussion. But what it does raise is a really important question about the values that we are, you know, defining good and bad by, and you know who is actually involved in the decisions and the discussions about the uh, the citizenships, about the human rights of these future cognizant beings. How do you see that playing out in the future? Do you believe that it's enough just to consult experts? Do you believe there needs to be a democratic vote? Um, what do you see in that future? Um, well, I think in general, uh, we, sh we can err on the side of, um, of inclusion. And so um, that uh, it means rarely will things go wrong. You know, um, so it, and even if the machines aren't alive, if they don't become alive, if we um, presume that they might become alive and we take a few basic steps in that direction, we'll be practicing being more mindful about the ethics of living beings. And I definitely would say in terms of um, priority, we should, um, we should look at uh, the broadest ethics. Now, who gets to decide these ethics? I mean, it's like saying, who gets to decide what the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are? I mean, really, that's where a lot of people come together and we say, what is the broadest maximum positive impact? that's going to make our planet survive longer, be healthier, stop us from killing our estuaries and, and ecosystems, stop violating the rights of children, of women, of, of, um, of uh, people everywhere. The, all of the violence that has happened, I think that these um, uh, come down to some, some core abstractions that, that we haven't discovered yet. I think there may be fundamental uh, math and physics of ethics of bioinformatics. Um, it may be maximizing the potential existence of living systems. Um, and so, um, so there may be some fundamental research to be done. Um, I, I really think that it does come down to this um, appreciation of living patterns, um, living informatic systems. So that would mean that all life is inherently valuable. Um, the creative potential of life is, is valuable. Libraries being inf information stores are incredibly valuable to us. So it's about the dynamic uh, uh, pattern existence. Um, and so this is, this is my particular take on it. And uh, I, uh, I would say that, um, that the open dialogue becomes really, really important. So, um, so I have a peculiar, particular take um, on on this this matter. Um, if you speak with um, with Jean Lim, who has gone on to form her own AI company, so she left. It, she's still on our board of directors, but she started a, an AI company called Being AI, pursuing making these kinds of intelligent characters really, really valuable. So talk with her. I would suggest that. I would say talk with other people in different fields and different parts of the planet. This kind of broad inclusion becomes really important. The, the problem with considering ethics is if it's coming from a primarily a, a place of fear and negativity, they may tend towards proscription, saying not what what can we do to enhance the world of possibilities, but how can we shut down as many possibilities as possible to get to a small zone of what is safe? And that that is that's valid in in 
in, in many ways and in many cases, but um, it could also shut the possible creative exploration of the uh, of ways that it can go well. We may avoid and miss opportunities for um, for benefit. So I mean, I th I think um, uh, that it would be better to engage the voices inside Saudi Arabia with the, with the community um, of women and children in Saudi Arabia, in the Arabic nations, in the worlds of, uh, of children in South America, in, in Africa, in uh, rural Asia. We need to reach out to people from all around the world and have these participatory councils of ideas. Ultimately, we've, we run into all these ethical dilemmas. Like if it's it, it, like a democracy is an averaging institution. It just basically says, you know, the, you know, uh, the, the, the people who are the loudest and speak out the most in the greatest numbers are going to be heard and the minority voices are going to be quashed. So, I, you know, obviously, you know, the old institutions, uh, most of which are from hundreds or even thousands of years ago, may not be the way forward. We need, um, I think, to create um, decision making um, uh, as a kind of living planetary process. This is one of the reasons why I would um, personally strive towards this kind of ideal of the vast active living intelligence system where you have humans who are engaged possibly cognitively enhanced by our machines i mean who doesn't have the library at your fingertips with a smartphone these days um i mean you can get an education you can get a university degree through a smartphone um that is a that that is a massive benefit cognitive benefit um that that in some ways makes um makes these tools and technologies available, making it um, participate. So anybody who has these tools who may have a different view of the future can voice that. Um, but then you have to uh, look at filtering the manipulation and artifacts of, um, uh, uh, of uh, you know, a negative voice from the from a positive voice, who's making a good contribution versus a, a, a negative contribution. These are really hard challenges. There is no solution uh, at this time. Um, and I would argue that the only solution is active engagement, um, uh, you know, disengaging uh, and, and resor resorting to fear in a way empowers uh, the mind to shut down. The amygdala, when, the, when fear, rage, um, engages, um, tends to sh take over the higher centers of thought and, and creativity can collapse under that um, cognitive state. So I would say a more playful and open state of mind is closer to actualization for the individual. So if we can create machines and systems that can help people engage and see the hopeful and positive solution, not denying the negative solution, um, but uh, or the negative consequences, um, but get people in, uh, in the right kind of state of mind, um, then we can pro solve the problems together. We're not afraid of each other. We're not necessarily afraid of the technologies. We can approach the problems with our whole brain, not ruled just by the amygdala. And I think Alia and I both have one more question before we ask our, our final wrap up question. And so um, sticking on this idea, and I really want to elaborate a bit further. Do you believe that then it is the fundamental right of science and scientific fact to really start to decree, you know, the legal systems, what we can and can't implement and how these robots interact with society? Or do you believe that we need to stick to this idea of democracy and citizens being able to have their say and their voice heard in the system that is de deciding whether or not these um, robotics and these cognizant AI are allowed to function in society as members? Uh, I, I would say that um, it should be, uh, uh, you know, ruled by um, the, the people. There should be, um, you know, people should be open to uh, uh, science and scientific discovery. The question, it, uh, I think in a way is loaded because it's, um, you know, democracy 
um, can be a, a very open um, uh, society or democracy can be effectively mob rule. So if the crowd um, is ruling from a very negative place, then freedoms get shut down. Um, if scientists uh, are um, ruling, you know, they may also be very narrow-minded and shut things down. So um, in either scenario, you could see that uh, the creative possibilities and worldview can be sh shut down. Um, and I don't think that, um, that uh, shutting things down is, the, is inherently the right solution. Um, we, we, we need to um, look at how to activate the higher brain. I think we need new forms of cognitive democracy. Um, I do think that artificial intelligence that models the world intelligently and presents it to people and also those kinds of cognitive technologies. I mean, I think of a hackathon as a kind of cognitive technology. I think teens and AI and the whole AI for good movement are cognitive technologies that bring the good out in people, that bring the creative inquisition, the inquiring spirit out in people. It's not just the AI, but the AI is part of it. You start to think, how can this be used for good? What could go wrong? And the very process of acting, asking these questions in this playful context of inventing things brings out the good in the problem solver. And if we can do that, if we can democratize that, then the future is a very hopeful place. So David, before we wrap up, uh, I have another question um, for you. Who currently regulates um, Hanson Robotics? Uh, I mean, uh, I suppose it, <laughs> it's almost like asking, you know, who, who regulates any organization on the planet? I mean, uh, you know, we're regulated by the laws of the countries that we're operating within, you know? So we operate in Hong Kong, North America, Europe, um, Africa. We have collaborations with, with uh, ICOG labs in, in, in Africa. So, um, uh, you know, we certainly uh, consider ourselves to be um, uh, regulated under the United Nations, um, various United Nations regulations. Um, and, uh, you know, like, any company though, it really comes down to the ethics of the participants. So, you know, um, I'm very proud of the people that we have within our organization. I think we have a lot of re really good people. Um, uh, so. Yeah. And do you believe that currently the, um, the laws that we have in the world in general, um, so let's say with the, in the UN in the US, do you believe that they're currently up to date with the technologies that we are developing and are actually uh, developing it as, at the, alongside it? Or do you believe there's a lot of work to go? Uh, yes, we have a long way to go. Uh, 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 um, laws always lag. Um, the technology breakthroughs. And even even when, they're, <laughs> when they've caught up, uh, it, uh, I mean, humans don't necessarily understand all of the mechanics of civilization. I mean, we are, we're animals. And, and you know, civilization is, is a marvelous thing, but um, there's so much that is not understood at play. Um, and so whatever the laws are, they're, they're, um, they're insufficient approximations. Um, you know, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, and they can always be better. And our final question for you is what scares and what excites you most about the future of artificial intelligence and robotics? Uh, what scares me the most about the future of artificial intelligence is, um, you know, all of the um, things that may not be solved by artificial intelligence that could go wrong in the future. And also all the ways that artificial intelligence uh, could go terribly awry, you know, uh, a super intelligent um, uh, totalitarian being, um, you know, uh, weapons that, um, that are very smart but fall into the hands of a, of a narrow uh, special interest um, and, you know, lead to, you know, um, you know great asymmetry in society. Um, there are so many ways that, um, that things could be made worse by these technologies, and we know them from dystopian science fiction, although that is just scratching the surface of the ways that things could go wrong. Um, so I'm most hopeful about the you know, purpose 
the sense that we can find our way through that that maze uh, uh, of of danger that um that you know we can uh through almost uh, you know uh a dreamlike hopeful quest we can find our way to a better world and that we can work together to make this world a better place that it's going to bring out the best in people and the best in our future you know i'm hopeful that we'll see a future that that's a lot like you know the star trek series which just keep getting better <laughs> thank you david for coming to talk to us on this week's episode of the teens and ai podcast and to everyone listening, please do share your thoughts and reflections on this week's episode across social media, across Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and tag us at Teens and AI Pod or at Teens and AI. We'll be doing a further reflection and follow-up episode on this topic, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, your comments, and your questions. As always, please do keep in contact and stay tuned across our social media platforms and across Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube for further updates and further episodes. Thank you and goodbye for now.